So we're going to finish up now in this little video about telescopes. And I think learning about magnification is pretty important because I think we come into this thinking that that's what we get telescopes for. I mean, obviously, we want to make things look bigger so that we can see them better. Um, you know, if you've looked at the moon through the telescope, it probably looked bigger than it did when you looked at it with your naked eye. But um, it's not necessarily true that magnification is the driving force for looking at objects in the sky like galaxies and um, other objects that an astronomer might be studying. Um, think about it this way. Um, think about how painstakingly astronomers are working with their telescopes to gather as much light as possible so that they can see something. And because of that, um, they don't want to spread it out because if I gather enough at light so I can just see this very faint star, if I then make that faint star look very big, I'm actually undoing everything that I did by gathering a lot, a lot of light, by spreading it over a larger area, and now it looks dim again. So um, for many types of objects in the sky that an astronomer might be studying, he actually doesn't want the magnification to be that big. Um, now, if we're looking at something like a planet or the moon, of course this changes. So um, it's just something to think about and to be aware of that for astronomers, magnification is not as big a deal as you might think. You can affect the magnification because the two things that go into play here are the objective lens or mirror and what its focal length is, and that's the distance from the lens or mirror to where the image is formed is the focal length, and then the focal length of the eyepiece. Now the eyepiece is the other lens that you use to look at your image and in most telescopes you can change that eyepiece lens and so you can if you don't want a lot of magnification you could make the focal length of the eyepiece be very large to decrease the magnification or if you're looking at something that's quite bright and it doesn't matter how much you magnify it you could choose to use a very short focal length um, so that's an interesting thing of how we can manipulate a telescope to, depending on what we want to view now so far we've really been focusing on optical telescopes and that would be telescopes that we use to view the visible part of the spectrum, the part of the spectrum we can see with our naked eye. But remember when you learned about light that there are many different types of light going from gamma rays to radio waves and we have um, astronomers study all of these and in this picture we're seeing that not all of these um, electromagnetic waves are able to reach the ground and so in some cases um, we have to put things up into the sky or actually up into an orbit in order to view them. Others like radio waves we can view from the ground. And radio astronomy is really the next thing that we want to talk about because this is pretty important and of course it is a uh, ground-based astronomy because you can detect radio waves at, um, at the surface of the Earth. Um, so we first realized that sky could, the sky could be the source of radio waves in 1931 and this is around the time that people were actually starting to use radios to communicate and um, they, some people realized that there was a certain point in the sky that they were always getting some sort of signal from and it turned out and this is might be kind of interesting to you that it, the point was coming seemed to be originating from the center of the constellation Sagittarius and it turns out that if you are looking towards the very center of that constellation you are actually looking towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy and at the center of the Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole and one of the things that is emitted as the gases are accelerated towards that black hole is they produce radio waves and so um, these radio waves that people had started using to communicate back and forth they didn't actually realize until that time that the 
sky could also be a source of radio waves, and this just blossomed a whole other area of astronomy because it turns out that many objects that we view in the sky and we can see with our naked eye are actually also giving off radio waves. The way that we sort of visualize them is we do produce images of the um, of what we're seeing with the radio waves, but we use different colors to represent different intensities. Remember that the radio waves have long wavelengths and low frequencies, and so because of the long wavelengths, radio waves are going to have inherently poor angular resolution because the longer the wavelength, the larger the resolution. So a radio telescope is basically like a dish that you might use if you have dish um, TV. Um, you have a collecting dish that has sort of a, a parabolic shape to it, and then there's going to be a receiver because what happens the radio waves are going to come into this dish and reflect off of it and then they're collected by the receiver and then the uh, receiver has to be sort of the image has to be processed using a computer and then we use um, the color coding to sort of represent the different intensities of radio waves that are coming from the object This is a very large radio telescope. This is actually one that um, was located in Puerto Rico. And you see that it's very, very big. Um, the picture on the right is an example of what a radio uh, telescope might see as it looks at Jupiter. Notice we have different colors. You, you still see some, you know, the, the general shape of Jupiter, of, <laughs> what did I say, Jupiter, it's Saturn. Um, but you still see uh, some different features. And sometimes you get different information that you didn't see with your naked eye. So radio telescopes have um, advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages is that you can use a radio telescope during the day because uh, the sunlight isn't interfering it with it. Obviously, you can't use a regular telescope during the day because the sunlight is really preventing you from seeing the other objects in the sky. It's overwhelming their light. Um, but a radio telescope, you can see at any time. Um, another thing is with a regular telescope, if you have cloudy or bad weather, you, um, you can't use it. And of course, the atmosphere is affecting it. But because of the long wavelengths of radio waves, um, the radio waves pass through bad weather clouds and the atmosphere pretty much unaffected. And of course, it's really giving us just another piece of the puzzle, um, allowing us to see something that we can't see with our naked eye, and it gives us more information about our universe that we're trying to learn about. Um, one of the major disadvantages of radio telescopes that we've alluded to several times now is that because we're talking about very long wavelengths, the angular resolution is not good. And so that is why radio telescopes have to be very, very large. Now there is a technique that sort of helps to um, overcome this and it's called interferometry. And in interferometry is a way to improve the resolution of radio telescopes. And what you're doing is you're actually using the principle of interference um, but you're using at least two, if not several, radio telescopes used together. And you, because they're at slightly different locations, the waves that come to the different telescopes will be slightly different. And so we can sort of put them together and use the way they interfere to produce a more refined image. And it turns out that the angular resolution is actually then equivalent to the distance between the two telescopes. So instead of creating one telescope that is a mile wide, we could use two radio scale telescopes that are a mile apart and we would get the same angular resolution. And so this is sort of a visual trying to, um, you know, illustrate that fact. And this is why often we see pictures like this where you have many, many radio telescopes um, all together and what they're doing is they're using interferometry to produce better images.
Um, other types of wavelengths that astronomers look at are ultraviolet, infrared, x-rays, and gamma rays. And studying all these will allow astronomers to get a more complete picture of what's going on in our universe. Um, this is just a picture of an x-ray telescope. Um, the whole setup is a little bit different in how the mirrors are used to reflect the x-rays. Um, it's quite a different setup. And this is a picture of um, something in the sky viewed in x-rays. And finally, we're just going to finish up looking at different pictures of the entire sky, but looking at it in different wavelengths to give you a sense of how um, studying all the different wavelengths gives us different information and allows us to get a more complete picture of what's going on in our universe.